Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, talking about anti-Americanism brings memories. It brings me back to a period of my life that I recall with embarrassment and with shame. It was the time around the terrorist attacks of 9-11 in 2001. I was 18 years old and I was already highly politicized. I was politicized with the Greek communist left, which means that anti-Americanism was a key aspect of my political identity, or even perhaps of my identity in general. So I remember the attacks very, very vividly. I literally watched them, the second plane live on TV. And as I was seeing the destruction, as I was seeing the horror, as I was seeing people jumping from skyscrapers in order to have a less horrible death than being burned alive, people who that morning kissed goodbye to their families, expecting that they would be back in the afternoon, while I was seeing the buildings collapsing, taking with them thousands of lives, my main feeling, my main sentiment was not sorrow and it was not horror. My main sentiment was a phrase in my mind. They had it coming. The Americans had it coming. My main sentiment was, this is revenge. This is revenge for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is revenge for Vietnam. This is revenge for Serbia. This is revenge for the suffering of the Palestinians. And I was not alone. I remember very vividly a guy that I knew since a kid in my neighborhood, after the second plane crashed, going out in his balcony and something like in a religious fervor, addressing no one in particular and shouting, finally justice, finally justice. And the interesting thing is that that guy was not a radical leftist like I was. He was a guy next door. He was an average Joe. But for the average Joe in Greece, or for many people in Greece, the attacks was an act of justice. And there were many opinion polls that verified this. They saw that one in four Greeks at the time, one in four Greeks, thought that the attacks were justified. A 28% of the populations thought that the attacks were an inside job, which means that the Americans caused this on themselves so that they could have a justification to do further attacks because nothing is beneath Americans, right? When asked at the time, who is the biggest threat for humanity, the then President Bush or Osama bin Laden? Guess what most Greeks picked? They said that Bush is a bigger threat than the biggest terrorist the world has ever known. And when it came to the question, should America retaliate and punish, retaliate militarily and punish those who did the attacks, only 4% of Greeks answered yes. The only country with a lower percentage in support for retaliation was Pakistan. So the United States was the one country that it was okay to kill its civilians, but it was not okay, not okay for it to retaliate. Sacrifice was okay, but justice was not okay. Some weeks after 9-11, I started university. 2001, and I finished it late in 2005. In all these four years, in one of the lecture theaters that I studied, over the wall, there was a sign, a slogan, which rhymes in Greece. It said, here it is an airplane flying over Manhattan. Oh, how I wish that every day would be 9-11. This slogan was signed by a very small and insignificant leftist group. But what I found very interesting is that in all these four years, no one bothered to erase it. Now, I realize that many of you at the moment will be feeling rage. Many of you might be feeling disgust. You might be saying, what am I doing in this country? 
Why do I sanction this country with my presence? And I want to tell you two things. The first is that a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Cultures can change for the better, and I think the Greek culture has changed for the better. But the other thing I want to tell you is that anti-Americanism, this prejudice against the United States, this systematic opposition to whatever the United States do, is not only a phenomenon of backwards Balkans. Anti-Americanism is a significant intellectual force in Europe. And I'll just give you two examples. Harold Pinter, a playwright and also a Nobel laureate, his comment around 9-11 was that the United States is the most dangerous power the world has ever known. It is a rogue state, he says, worse than Nazi Germany. Worse than Nazi Germany. So you have the country that did the Holocaust and the country that defeated those who did the Holocaust. But for this Nobel laureate, the worst of the two is the country, is the United States. Another Nobel laureate, Dario Fo, his reaction after 9-11, he says, what are some thousands of deaths in New York compared to the millions of deaths caused every year by big speculators? So the idea is that there are these capitalists in the tower. Every year, somehow, we don't know how, kill millions of people. So dropping some airplanes to them is no big deal. So the question I want to ask today is why? Why such hatred for the United States? Why such hatred which becomes inhuman? And I'll give you a clue. That hatred has little, if anything, to do with US foreign policy. It has very little, if anything, to do with Bush, with Trump, or with Biden. Between ourselves, we can discuss a lot about mistakes that the United States have done. We can discuss a lot about bad presidents, about bad intellectual trends in the United States, but this is not why the United States is hated. How do I know this? I know this because anti-Americanism has been a significant force before the United States did any, quote, imperialistic intervention. Exhibit A. In May of 1944, Nazism still was not defeated and, communist, and, and the Red Army was marching through Eastern Europe. At that time, the soon-to-be founder and editor of Le Monde, Le Monde is in France a very significant intellectual outlet, he wrote an article and he said to Europeans, Europeans beware. The United States is qualitatively more dangerous than Nazism and communism. The Nazis and the communists were still killing people, but he said they are, the Americans are more dangerous. Why? Well, he said, the Nazis and the communists have at least a tragic grandeur. They stand for something. There's something in them. Whereas the Americans, they stand for nothing. They stand for nothing but cheap materialism. Now notice, this is May 1944. At this point, there's no Hiroshima, there's no McCarthyism, there is no Vietnam, there is no support for Israel, there is no support for Pinochet, there is nothing of the usual things that we hear from anti-Americanism as the reason for their hatred for America. Who was the biggest mind in Europe at that mind, supposedly? The biggest philosopher of Europe in the 20th century here, Martin Heidegger. He had a similar take on the United States. He said, Americans are more dangerous than communism. He didn't compare them with Nazis because he was okay with Nazism. Americans, he says, are more dangerous than communism. Why? Because communism, he says, is just a political system. I mean, how, how much damage can a political system do? But America, he says, is a civilization. And a civilization can do irreparable damage. 
An English writer, D.H. Lawrence, puts it differently, but he says the same thing. He says, Americans are worse than the communists. And here's why. A communist will crash your house. A communist will crash your property. A communist might even crash your skull. But America, he says, America will crash your soul. America will crush your soul. So we need to ask the question, what is it in America that supposedly is crushing souls? In other words, we need to ask, what is the essence of the United States? Why is, what is so characteristic about this country that makes it a civilization? We need to ask then, what is Americanism? And this is weird. Why is a country with an ism? We don't say Polandism. We don't say Belgiuism. But we say Americanism. And this, is because Ameri and this is because America is not just a country. It's also a mindset. It's also a way of understanding your life and the world. America is also an idea. Put differently, America was founded by some people who were intellectuals and revolutionaries at the same time, who said, we need to create a country based on some principles. We want to live in a particular way, and in order to live in that way, we need to form a country. Now, no offense to my fellow Balkans, but this is not how countries in Balkans were formed. It was mostly, I will fight you, and you will fight me, and whoever wins takes this land. This is not how the United States were formed. So what is this idea? Ayn Rand identified this idea. It's the idea of individualism. The United States were built based on this idea. In simple terms, it means your life is yours. You live for your own happiness, and you're not the servant of, every, of anyone. Now, this might sound as something which is self-evident, but it was not. You, are, you do not live for God, you do not live for Pope, you do not live for the king, you do not live for the proletariat, you live for yourself. And once you decide that you live for yourself, then you need to form a form of government that supports this sentiment. So the, the American government is also revolutionary because for the first time in history, you have a government which is not, so usually every government would answer one question. Who are you a servant of? Some governments would say, you're a servant of God, you're a servant of the emperor, or you're a servant of the many. Even democracy basically asks the answer to the question, who are the servants of the many? This is how, how, this is how Socrates drinks the conium. Sorry, Socrates, the many have decided, off you go. But American government, the idea behind it is different. The idea is that the state is here to protect you from all these forces. Even the American constitution is unique. The constitution of the United States tells you what the state is not supposed to do to you. The Greek constitution basically tells you what protects the states from you. It has, for example, an article, Article 16, which says that only the state can run higher education institutions. I mean, how different it is from the American Constitution. So this is, what, uh, this, is, this is why the United States is a special country. But notice, it's a special country, but based on a set of ideas that are universally applicable. Any country in any part of the world, if people understand these principles, could apply these principles. And of course, even in the United States, they were not properly applied. For many years, they did not apply to everyone. But they were very good principles. They were very noble principles. And who was the person who mostly understood these principles? An immigrant from Soviet Union, Ayn Rand. So you don't have to be an American to be a patriot for these principles. Or on the other hand, many people born and raised in the United States don't get these principles. And some of them even end up becoming presidents of the United, of the United States. So 
now that we hopefully have an understanding of what the country stands for, let's go back and understand why it's hated so much. The pursuit of happiness, central to the American ideology. Why is this idea so triggering to so many intellectuals? Because we've been told forever that there's nothing noble in happiness, but there's something noble in what? In suffering, in sacrifice. The church told you so, the communists told you so, and conservatives are telling you so. So now having a society built on the idea that, no, go after the good life. This is threatening. There was a French avant-garde artist, I mean, she's still around, I think, who thought that the most characteristic example of American culture is Disneyland. Why? Because it's this place uh, which is a note to happiness, to having a good time, to joy. And she characterized Disneyland as cultural Chernobyl. Cultural Chernobyl. So having a good time, apparently, is radioactive. There's a very famous Greek playwright who said, the United States is not noble because it has never suffered. It has never felt pain. And the famous Marxist playwright Bertolt Brecht had a similar sentiment. During the war, he was living in Santa Monica in California. And in his memoir, he says, this life there was insufferable. It was too nice. It was too quiet. It was too tidy. It's like this meme with the rainbow and the dog says, this is unbearable. So then he went to live to East Germany and he had no such problems. So, <laughs> so intellectuals don't like America because apparently the pursuit of happiness is a shallow endeavor. Another reason they don't like America is because they see it as the country of materialism, as a country too much consumed with this world's pursuits, with creating stuff. So supposedly, there's these two ideas, like the world of ideals and the world of stuff. And the world of stuff is inferior. A German author, Gerhard Hauptmann, said dismissively that America is the country of business and the country of the dollar. I think he's right, but he's wrong in his evaluation. It is indeed the country of business. Because once you tell people it's okay to be happy, it's okay to pursue what you're after, you will go after productive endeavors. You might go after creating stuff. And while you created stuff and you exchange it with other people, the trader principle as we heard yesterday, you become richer. So for the first time in history, someone gives you the pat in the back which says, it's okay to create. And it's okay to make money out of this process. And this is the essence of capitalism at the end of the day. You have a right to your productive endeavor. And this is a very hard pill to swallow for many, many European intellectuals. This is why anti-Americanism and anti-capitalism go hand in hand. So till now we've seen America is bad because they go after happiness and also it's the, it's the country of business and dollar. Another intellectual, a French Marxist, Louis Aragon, he says, it's not only the country of business, it's the country of the fridge and the bathtub. And these are supposedly, again, bad things. Why is the fridge and the bathtub a bad thing? Again, because it shows that you're only concerned with your pleasure. And this is not something good. But if you think about it, if you want to have a good life, if you respect yourself, then the fridge and the bathtub are good. So I would reply to Aragon, yes, America is indeed the country of the fridge and the country of the bathtub. But if your standard is life is suffering, then the fridge and the bathtub is a bad thing. If your standard in life is that I want to sacrifice for others, then there's nothing virtuous in the fridge or in the bathtub. I don't sacrifice for anyone when I take a hot shower. <laughs> and if your life, if your standard is life, is to have as little impact on mother nature, for example, as possible, then the bathtub and the fridge are bad. And then the United States is a bad country. 
Unfortunately, some of the most brilliant and productive people in the United States have bought into that story. They agree that there's not much, there's not merit in production. There's not merit in business. Yes, we are the country of business, but there's not much there. It took a genius like Ayn Rand to tell them, you are wrong. Being the country of business is good. In a quote in Atlas Rag, which I'll paraphrase because otherwise I'll butcher it, she says, for the first and only kind and to the glory of mankind, there was a country of money. A country of money. And she says, and there's no higher and most the most reverent tribute that I can pay to America than to call it a country of money. Because this means a country of reason, a country of achievement, a country of production, and a country of happiness. And of course, you will notice that America has not only given us the fridge and the bathtub. They have given us great art. They have given us great music, great films. They has given us science. America has literally landed man on the moon. 50% of the medicines that save lives and make our life better come from the United States, the country of the fridge and the bathtub. And this is no coincidence. If you understand what is the connection between you being let free to use your mind and to pursue stuff, then you realize that the sky is the limit. So yes, America was based on an idea, but it's an idea that delivered to the extent that it was observed. Good ideas bring good results. Bad ideas bring bad results. So why was America the greatest country ever? Because it was based on the values that make a good life. Be reasonable, be rational, be productive, go after your happiness, sky's the limit. So ask yourselves, if people find this code of values bad, offensive, or cheap, what are their values? What are the haters of America after? If they found this code of values that have made these miracles bad, what is their code of values? What are they after? Answer this question, and I think you'll understand what I hinted towards earlier that America is not hated for its vices, real or imagined. And in the Q&A, we can discuss the real or imagined vices of the United States. America is hated mostly for the things that are good at it, for the values on which it is based. So to end, and to return to my 18-year-old self, to return to that guy who watched the horror of 9-11, and his first reaction was justice, I think that my biggest problem was not that I was anti-American. My, my biggest problem was the darkness in my soul. My biggest problem was that I considered happiness and achievement as something that was not noble. Either it was not noble or people could only achieve it by exploiting others. So in, no in a way, I was promoting a political, theory, a political ideal that would make everyone as miserable as I was. And to change my politics, I first had to change the way I viewed life. I first had to change the way I view the world. And at the end of the day, this is what philosophy is. How do you view the world? When I understood or slowly started understanding that, you know what, happiness and achievement you can make it. Happiness and achievement are possible. And they're not only possible, they're good. This is when I started, this is when I stopped hating the United States. And this is when I started appreciating the noble code of values that this country is based on and the wonders that it has given us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let's start from there, yeah. Thank you for your talk. 
I was wondering, I, I feel like many of the criticism on Americanism is not about uh, achieving things, it's about a culture that uh, encourages consumerism, about uh, that, that attaches happiness with consuming things and that the goal of many people in American culture uh, is to buy the better car, the more beautiful car, get a, a more beautiful lady, like it's trying to be, it, it's, a, it's about the superficial things. Uh, and I wonder how it uh, how it relates. I think that part of the values that America promotes with uh, the freedom and achieving and stuff like that do promote the superficial thinking of achieving. Consuming is happiness. Buying right. a new microwave will make you happier. So what's very interesting in the argument of anti-consumerism is, is that it used to be an argument mostly by leftists, and now it's adopted by conservatives. Think about that famous line in Fight Club, Tyler Durden. We work jobs that we, don't, that we hate in order to buy things that we don't want. Back in the day, it was leftists like me back then that we would use this. Today, you find it mostly on the right. Here's the interesting thing with the stuff. I don't know a single person who, if you ask them, are you a consumerist, and do you buy things that you don't want, they will say yes. Mostly they say, no, it's these other people that are consumerists, but me, I'm not. So, first of all, what is consumerism? No, I feel like most people will have tons of clothes in, their, in, the, in the closet that they don't want and they throw away after not wearing it even once. Right. Know it. So, but who is to judge whether they need it or not? My problem with the idea of consumerism is that at the bottom of it, it's usually not that people think, oh, you should have three dresses and you have five is that going after dresses is a bad thing in itself. And I disagree with this. Now, I don't like, for example, expensive cars, but I like other things. But usually, the problem is that with you wanting material stuff, it's this idea that if you want material stuff, it's a bad thing, but if you, if you want uh, to be a man of, you know, of ideals, it's a good thing. This dichotomy between the world of ideas and the world of things, the, the latter being bad, I think this is what lies behind anti-consumerism. So I find anti-consumerism almost a Christian religious attitude transferred first to the left and now to the right. So, yeah, sometimes you could say I bought things that I didn't really need. But this does not mean that wanting stuff is bad. I would say the opposite. Wanting, vi wanting values. So, for example, if you join, let's say, if you buy five CDs, is this consumerism? You like music, you have this value in your mind, and the CD is how this value is materialized. Or let's say you buy a lot of uh, pieces of art. You have an appreciation of something, and the painting is the materialization of it. So I understand that a lot of people make consumer co choices that I don't share, but I don't believe that, cons quote, consumerism is something which is inherently or in essentially bad. Wanting things is having values. You have to be careful what things you want, but I don't think that wanting material things is a problem. Actually, it's the opposite. It's your values materialized into something. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Pat. I am from Georgia. I have one comment and just one proposition, Don't, not directly question. The first of all, from my point of view, Entire Americanism is very much supported by uh, socialist policy and the center of socialist policy during the last century was the Soviet Union. And of course, I'm not surprised because I was born in Soviet Union and I uh, <laughs> survived and now we are in Protestant changes. So now my, uh, my uh, proposition. Me and my colleagues were presenting here New Economic School, Georgia, which is free market oriented same tank. And we are dealing with such issues. And we are uh, inviting you during the break, one of the table in the garden, maybe we can discuss what we are doing, how we are doing. And it would be very nice to meet some of you who are interested in such kind of development. Thanks, Thank Madam. When I encounter anti-Americanism, it's not usually from professional intellectuals just because I try to disassociate myself from them and I just speak to normal human beings. And what usually tends to happen is that they, their criticisms are very valid. So they won't criticize 
the ideal of America and what America actually stands for, but they'll criticize the bad things that America has done and say, this is America. So I wonder if you, because you've spoken about how the intellectuals are anti-American, and I wonder if you see a difference between how the intellectuals, the intellectual anti-Americanism and just the average person's anti-American mentality. So the intellectuals are setting the stage. I mean, this is how all ideas are spreading. So what, what do you want to take? Let's take, for example, the, the war in Iraq. All the, there was all this, uh, the, the, this horror about America attacking Iraq. But it was always on the premise that Iraq should be left alone. Not on the, not on the fact that America has, na, uh, has no business there because it has no self-interest, national self-interest to put this way in Iraq. It was that Iraq has a national sovereignty, that Saddam Hussein has a so national sovereignty. So a guy who has started multiple wars, a guy who is gassing his own people, a guy with inf infamous torture chambers, that guy should be left alone. Now, I don't buy that the people who believe this have a very genuine concern about human life and their problem is with, uh, I don't know, some ca civilian casualties by Americans. Or, let's take the war in Vietnam. I can understand and I would agree with them with someone saying that the war in Vietnam is a mistake. But, if you wave the flag of North Vietnam, and if you parade the streets singing Ho 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 Chi Minh, NFL is go uh, the National Liberation Front is going to win, then I'm not really persuaded that what you are after is humane values. I mean, there have been even intellectuals who were in favor of the Iranian Revolution. They were, so there hasn't been a single enemy of the United States that they are not jumping on board to support it. And this is why I think that people like who we can agree on what are our values, we can criticize the United States. If you wave the flag of North Vietnam, or if you are simping for Putin, as many people today are doing, even within the freedom movement, I don't want to name names. If you are simping for Putin, I cannot discuss, I'm not, I have no interest to discuss with you on how America is bad. So you are right, this was a public sentiment, but as all the public sentiments, the, set, the, the, the tone is set by the intellectuals. So, for example, in Greece, the left hated the United States for obvious reasons, but also the right hated the United States because they saw it as this power of modernity, that uh, this power of modernity that takes away our traditions and takes away our faith. So, yes, there is popular sentiment in it, but it starts from the intellectuals from above. Thank you. Oh, Nikos, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, thank you. I wonder if you can talk a bit more about the, the kind of new anti-Americanism we see from within the American right today, where it's sort of like, oh, look, we've been liberalism, and now we have you know, all this terrible postmodern nonsense. We should be more like these Balkan countries and their religious conservatism. And how do you see that plays out? So that's very interesting. The people who are telling we want to make America great again have zero idea what America is about. And I... I mean, I have proof about that. I read a book recently by someone, by a, national, by a very prominent national conservative. And he says, America is no special. America is like all other countries. It is based on a people, on a common, on a land, and a common history. This is like saying, America is like the Balkans. So you want to make America great, and you are using the exact same, under the, the, and you have an understanding of the United States, which is the same understanding as the people who don't appreciate this country. Or you want to make America great again, and what you want to do is you want the United States to have a government like the European, like you want to take away what was special in understanding American government. You want the government to be the one who would lead the people to, 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 and not something that would be the servant of the individual in their pursuit of happiness. So the new right is not only they don't understand America, they are anti-American. Simple as that. No, and again, not to mention, not to mention, I won't mention libertarians now. Let's, let's talk about it at some other point. Uh, Nikos, thank you very much for your great talk. Thanks. I have... One comment. Um, could you elaborate of how anti 
Americanism is usually proposed by dictat the dictatorships and by socialist regimes as a way of masquerading their own violations of individual rights. Yeah. It's, it's very, the, the most characteristic, so you asked anti-American and how it's used by authoritarian regimes. If you go on the north to Albania, Albania was the strictest Stalinic dictatorship in the world after Cambodia. So in terms of crazy communist countries, it was Cambodia, Albania, under Enver Hoxha. If you go to Albania, every few kilometers, there are bunkers everywhere. Now, this was, notice, this was one of the poorest countries in the world. Definitely the, way, the poorest country in Western world, including all the communist countries. So here you have a country which is starving. Here you have a country with zero regrets for individual rights, and they had bunkers every 200 meters. Why? In case there was an imperialistic intervention. So in their mind, what was eminent was that America was like, we are so jealous of socialist Albania, and we're going to attack them. Or every thug in the Middle East, America is what he's selling to his, uh, to his people, anti-Americanism and anti-Israeli sentiments. So, and the problem though is that it works. It works. You had people like Sartre, other very prominent European intellectuals who travel to these dictatorships and they're like, here we have a new model. Here we have a new, a breath of fresh air. The breath of fresh air were the torture chambers. But why a breath of fresh air? Because they're anti-imperialistic. Notice now, right? Soviet Union literally had occupied militarily. Literally, they were like, the Red Army was there. You couldn't miss it. They had occupied half of Europe. They had all these actual imperialistic occupations, the tanks in Warsaw, the tanks in Prague. But apparently, it was American imperialism which was the danger. So you're perfectly right. Anti-Americanism was the justification, but it didn't only work within the societies, it also worked, unfortunately, also in Europe. And again, the intellectuals have a big uh, part to, of blame to take. How much time? Thank you very much. Okay, we can take some more questions, yeah. Thanks for your talk. So I liked your story, and I want to know what changed you from being how you described yourself, because I'm hoping to learn something from that that I can take to change other people. Okay, so what mostly changed is myself. I mean, the way I view life. I was a sad person. I was someone who was never really happy. And again, I thought this is how it reflects to the world. So what actually changed is coming across the, what you, we could describe as ideology of humanism. Not how it's used today, but like the idea that human beings are good. So for example, I believed in overpopulation. I saw every human being as a burden on planet Earth. But then I thought, wait a minute. We're not only cons greedy consumers that you know, destroy stuff. We're also creating stuff. We're not just mouths to be fed. We have hands that can create things. So I started seeing human beings as worthy. And then you see yourself also as at least potentially worthy. And then you ask yourself, is my current political philosophy compatible with the way I view the world? So if you're a misanthrope, being a Stalinist anti-Americanism is a good recipe. I mean, it's not good, but it fits. If you love humans, and then at the same time you're a Stalinist, you know, it doesn't work. So sooner or later, the one will, the one will, your philosophy is going to influence your politics. By the way, conservatives say something right. Politics is downstream from culture, but they need to add something more. And culture is downstream from philosophy. So this is why also sometimes when we discuss with classical liberals or libertarianism, you don't change the world only with politics. And to change the world, you don't start with politics. You start from philosophy. Um, so I, I have more of a comment and then uh, to see how you would respond to this. Sure. Uh, I personally am very interested in the topic that you shared today. And one of the biggest reasons why I'm studying in Europe is uh, to understand why the West is so prosperous and still other countries struggle to get even close to that. 
and um, I have read towards that a book, and uh, maybe you know the book by Niall Ferguson, and it's called The West and the Rest, and he gives, uh, I think, seven or six different factors as the soil, why the West is so prosperous. Uh, so his uh, reasons or his arguments is that uh, the people had competition, science, property-oriented garment, uh, consumerism, medicine, and Protestant, Protestant ethics. These are one of the biggest factors why the West is so prosperous and where the United States today is, is towards, because of this. And uh, on the contrary to your, to what individualism is and altruism is, uh, I find still United States, yes, it is an individualistic society, but highly and the most charitable and altruistic uh, nation. Uh, and I don't, I think that can be also a part of the reason why it continues to be so. I'll address the first part, but let's, let's agree on something. Being charitable with being self-sacrificial is not contradictory. Sorry, being charitable does not mean you're self-sacrificial. Let me give you an example. You I see... use the word altruism or altruistic. Okay, so being altruistic, being altruistic the way Ayn Rand uses it is not the same as many. So let's use the term on which we agree. Being benevolent mm -hmm. is, not, does not, is not contrary to you being prosperous and flourishing. I would actually say it might go hand in hand. You have a good life, you love life, and you want to see other people having a good life as well. Or you hate unnecessary suffering, you see unjust suffering, and if it is within your means and in within the means that it won't make you suffer, you want to help. So I don't think these things are contradictory. But to the first part of your question, I think there's only one reason why the West is different from the rest. And it has to do with the values that the West, that at some point, became big in the West. The values that it's okay to use your mind, and actually it's a good thing to use your mind, and that you should be, to an extent, free to do so. Compare this with societies that are still backwards, societies that today that tell you that if you think for yourself, you need to be last, societies that today are telling you that women are bad, that women are inferior, and the funny thing is, these societies, who do they accuse for their backwardness? Supposedly the United States. Supposedly Western imperialism. Whereas what is keeping them back is not Western imperialism. It is their horrible ideals. It is their horrible values. So what made the West great was, and now this could be a lecture of itself, but it is actually the good ideas that were in the West. The same with the United States. A good idea that delivered to the point that this good idea was observed. But it needed soil, like... Uh, as it I needed discussed. soil, you say? And science uh, or consumerism or Protestant ethics, uh, all, all these other factors were the soil, why it could happen there. Protestant ethics is a big discussion. But you mentioned soil. Hong Kong did not become big, big uh, prosperous because of soil. So many countries became prosperous, lacking many of the things that supposedly made the West great. So it's a recipe that can, be, that can be applied to everywhere in the world, as long as they observe these ideas. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have time for one more? Okay, I'm usually the one who cuts people off, so I'll cut myself off. Thank you very much.